Perfect. Okay, so uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Joey Palmer from uh, University of Chicago at Urbana-Champaign, who is going to tell us about lifting complexity one torus actions to integrable systems. So take it away, Joey. Yeah, great. So, so uh, yeah, first of all, thanks for the invitation. It, it's great to be able to, to, to talk in this seminar. Um, right, so, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about, about lifting complexity one torus actions to integrable systems, and uh, I'll mention a couple of different projects um, and so, uh, different aspects will be joint either with, with, with Sonia Holak or with, um, Susan Tolman and, uh, Yichen Leo, who you, who you may know as Jason, who her, is her, um, uh, grad student. So, right. So I'll, I'll start with some setup, which will be, well, there'll be no surprises for most of the people here. Um, so M omega for today will always be compact. I guess I should have written connected, compact and connected symplectic manifold of dimension two N. Uh, and as we know, if you're given a real function on a symplectic manifold, this induces the Hamiltonian vector field with this equation. Um, and we can then take the flow of this Hamiltonian vector field uh, to get a R action. So to me, this is sort of the basis of, of the idea of integrable systems, this relationship between um, group actions and, and, uh, and functions. Um, okay. So uh, right, and I've, I've assumed that M is compact, so there's, there's, there's no problem here saying that this gives a R action. Um, okay, so an integrable system is sort of an n-dimensional version of the same thing. We start with a um, symplectic manifold of dimension 2n, and uh, we equip it with n real-valued functions, which I can um, package together into this thing f, which I'll call the, the moment map or momentum map. Depending, uh, depending what you prefer. Um, and uh, so when you package them together, you have a function into Rn, and uh, it's supposed to satisfy some things. So the components should Poisson commute. So there's various ways we can, we can write this. Uh, I could use the Poisson bracket, or I could avoid it, and I could write it um, like this. And they should be independent. Right. So. There's various things you can learn from these these conditions. The things that are most important, I think, for us is that uh, the flows of these vector fields commute. Um, this is a, a consequence of the fact that they that they Poisson or that the functions Poisson commute. Um, and so what that means is that so each of these functions gives you an R action, but all of those R actions commute. So actually, f uh, generates. an Rn action. Um, and the other thing that's kind of important, and I, and I also think is important to mention in terms of the motivation of these uh, types of systems, is that each of these functions are preserved by the Hamiltonian flow of all of the other functions. Um, so the, I mean, this obviously will have mathematical significance, but also it's kind of the reason that people care about integrable systems, or at least people cared about them initially. Um, because kind of the concept here is that this should model a physical system with conserved quantities. Um, so a typical situation would be that like F1 maybe is uh, the total energy, the, ha the Hamiltonian of the system, in which case the flow generated by F1 is actually the, um, the dynamics of the system. And then the fact that the other functions are all preserved by that flow means that there are other conserved quantities. So maybe F2 is angular momenta and F3 is linear momenta or, or whatever, that um, as you evolve the system, these functions stay uh, fixed. That, that, that's, that's kind of the, the point of the integrable systems historically, I guess. Uh, but for me, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to specify that one of them is the Hamiltonian or anything like this. It's really more about uh, group actions, I guess. Anyway, so we have a function F on a symplectic 2n manifold that generates uh, an Rn action. And so again, I'll spend two minutes saying things that probably most people here know, um, which is we should first talk about our favorite kind of Rn actions, which is when all of the R actions are periodic. So, um, so a torque integrable system is uh, if F generates an effective um, S1 to the N, N action, right? I mean, it, in general, it, it induces a, an RN action, but that RN action might descend to a TN action, essentially what I'm saying. Um, 
so lots are known, lots and lots of things are known about toric systems. I, I, I assume everyone here knows these things. So I'll just say them briefly. Um, so it's a result from uh, the early 80s of Atiyah and Gilman Sternberg that in this case, the image of the moment map, which turns out to be an extremely important object, is, uh, is a polytope. It's actually the convex hull of the fixed points of the torus action. Um, and uh, more is true. So by the work of Delzant, we know, first of all, that uh, this polytope isn't just any polytope. It satisfies certain conditions, which I'll call Delzant conditions. Um, and uh, moreover, that actually every type of Delzant poly, you know, every possible polytope satisfying those conditions shows up as the image of a, of a toric integrable system um, uniquely. So what, what I mean, and, and maybe I should write something here, the map sending M omega F to the Delzant polytope, which is its image, um, if you quotient by the correct uh, isomorphisms on both sides, is, uh, is a bijection. And so the takeaway from this is that if you want to study things about toric integrable systems, you can really just look at the polytopes. Everything is, in, is encoded in the polytope. Um, so in particular, toric, toric integrable systems are actually um, uh, toric varieties, smooth toric varieties. Um, right, okay, so the, this, is, this is the nicest type of integrable system. Um, let me introduce the other main player in the talk today, which are um, complexity one spaces. So th these have been extensively studied by, by various people, especially Yale Karshan and Sue Tolman. Um, and they have many papers about this. I, I've listed the papers from 01, 03, and 14, because these are, I don't know, some of the important ones, but there's, there's lots actually. Um, and essentially what we do is we take the very nice situation of a toric integrable system, which is going to be n functions that generate a torus action, uh, and just forget one of the functions. So, so say we have an action of a torus that isn't quite the maximal dimension. It isn't quite n-dimensional, but it's, it's one less than that. Um, and in this case, actually, I, I didn't say this on the previous slide. Maybe I should have. But the atiyah gilman sturmring theorem still applies. The um, moment image uh, of this action is, is still a polytope and it's still the convex hull of the fixed points. Um, but Delzant's theorem definitely does not apply. So, so what I mean by that is that um, there's lots of different complexity one spaces with the same moment image. So you can't, you can't classify them by just looking at the moment image. Uh, the situation is much more complicated and actually I'll talk about it um, later. So right, uh, if I have a Hamiltonian action of um, of s one to the n minus one. This means I have a Hamiltonian function. I, I could, I mean, may I should have actually. There's an equation for uh, for this to be the the moment map. I guess I should call it the moment map of this uh, uh, complexity one torus action. But actually, because I'm talking about integrable systems today, and because I'm thinking from the point of view of integrable systems, it's perfectly fine to just say I'm going to think of this moment map as the data of n minus one real valued functions. Um, and then just like, I mean, just like on the previous slides with toric systems, each of those functions generates an R action. And I just have the requirement that those, all those R actions together um, descend to a, a, a torus action of dimension n minus one. So, I mean, there's various ways to look at things, but if you're thinking about it from the point of view of integrable systems, I like to think of it as a bunch of real functions. Um, okay, and so uh, in 2014, Karshan and Tolman classified uh, the complexity one spaces that are called tall. And so later in the talk, I'll talk about what tall means and I'll talk about their classification, but I um, just put a pin in that for now, I guess. Um, and, and actually, uh, I'm just going to identify the momentum map with the choice of n minus one functions. That, that's the, um, I mean, I was just saying that a minute ago, I guess. So the main two things I have, I have introduced in my first 10 minutes here are toric integrable systems, which is when you have n functions that generate a torus action altogether, and complexity one spaces, which is when you have n minus one functions that um, generate a torus action. So if you started with a toric system, 
you can certainly obtain a complexity one space by just forgetting. Oh, actually, I, I've been, I wrote forget F1, but I should write forget Fn. Um, just forget one of the functions, right? You start with the torque system, you throw one of the functions away, you're left with a complexity in one space. Um, so that's nice. It's a good way to get a bunch of examples of complexity one spaces. Uh, hopefully, if this theory is interesting, it is not a way to get all examples of complexity one spaces, because hopefully there should be new things. Um, so uh, what I want to talk about, and what I'll talk about for the, the whole talk today in, in various different versions, is when can we do the opposite? When can we? When can we lift, right? If I give you a complexity one space, can you look at the complexity one space or look at its invariance or look at some data about it and try and figure out when you can construct an additional function that, that makes it into a toric system? And, and this is one of the reasons I want to think about these things as a bunch of real value functions. Obviously, it's equivalent, but I think it makes it a little bit easier to state this, um, this question. Uh, and in fact, this question can be made more more general. Maybe I don't want a torque system. Maybe I just want an integrable system. Um, you could ask the same thing. If you start with the complexity one space, when can you lift it to an integrable system, which is nice somehow, right? Torque is extremely nice, but there's other classes of integrable systems that are interesting. So I think I have, yeah, I have a slide with this written on it. Um, so for instance, in dimension four, you might wonder when you can lift to a semi torque system uh, or, or something like that. You know, starting with a complexity one action, you just need one, you just need one more function for an integrable system. I guess that's the point I want to make. And um, if you want an integrable system with nice properties, what can you see about if that's possible from the complexity one space? Um, so here's my main question. It's exactly what I just said, right? Given a complexity one space, which is the data of n minus one functions, when can we find that last sum function so that um, m omega f1 up to fn is a nice integrable system? And of course, nice can mean various things, which is why there's various papers um, in, this, in this area. Um, so right, so the, the rest of the talk will be about what is already known and, and stuff I've been working on in various guises of this. Uh, of this question. Okay, so I'll start with the simplest case, which is, um, well, the simplest case, the most foundational case, maybe I should say, um, which is when the dimension of m is equal to four. So if you have a dimension of m equal to four, then a complexity one space is just a single function that generates an effective S1 action. And then what we're asking is, when can we find the other function so that we can end up with a nice integrable system. So first of all, I should mention that um, uh, this object, an effective S1 action, an uh, effective Hamiltonian S1 action on a uh, symplectic four manifold is called a Hamiltonian S1 space. And these were introduced by, uh, by Yael Karshan in, uh, in her memoirs paper from 1999. Uh, and I'll reference this paper many times today, actually. This paper is extremely important. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so they were introduced by, by, by Yale in 99 and, and, uh, and classified. And, and I'll, I'll talk about, about some, some results from her paper that are important for us. OK, and so the first question is when the word nice means toric. Given a Hamiltonian S1 space, when can you lift it to a toric integrable system on a four manifold. That's what I'm asking. <clears throat> and, and this is also appears in that same paper of, uh, of Karshans. So if you start with um, a Hamiltonian S1 space, M omega F1, uh, it's classified by what's called the, um, the Karshan graph. From the data of the Hamiltonian S1 space, you can write down a combinatorial object, which is the, the Karshan graph. And so I will tell you very quickly how to do this. So each feature of the group action shows up as a feature of the, um, the graph. So um, for instance, if you have a, a two-dimensional surface that's fixed by the S1 action, 
then this is represented by what's called a fat vertex. And I'll draw a fat vertex. Well, to me, it's kind of like a tall vertex. I, I should make a comment. I'm going to describe the way that, um, I'm going to describe the, the, the graph that, um, that Karshan developed in this paper, but I'm going to draw my graph 90 degrees off of how she usually draws it. it, it uh, it's sort of how I learned doing them because they're more compatible with semi toric systems and it, it's gotten to the point where I just can't draw them the other way without making mistakes. So, so I'll draw them. Uh, uh, I mean, they're just 90 degrees. They're the same, they're the same picture otherwise. Um, anyway, uh, so every fixed surface of the S1 action corresponds to a fat vertex of the graph, one of these, these um, large ones, and it'll be labeled with the genus of that surface, right? It's, it corresponds to a fixed surface and uh, the area of that surface. You can take the symplectic area of that surface. You'll get some number. Um, okay, so there's one thing. It actually turns out, uh, it's not totally obvious, but it's true that every time you have a fixed point of a Hamiltonian S1 action, you're on one of these Hamiltonian S1 spaces, either it's part of an entire surface that's fixed or it's all alone. So it'll be an isolated fixed point. And those will just will just represent by a, a regular vertex. So sort of the fat vertex is there because it's a whole surface that's fixed, and the regular vertex is just a single point. Uh, and so again, not obvious, but it turns out that the only other thing that can happen um, in terms of the group action is uh, that you can have a point with some uh, uh, zk isotropy. And so they show up on what's called a zk sphere. And what I mean by that is you have a sphere sitting inside of your uh, four manifold that's sort of rotating k times too fast, right? When you um, when you take the action by the entire S one, it rotates this this sphere rotates k times. So all of the points on here have isotropy group given by um, by zk. And of course, I'm only going to care about ZK spheres if K is uh, at least two, because a Z1 sphere doesn't really mean it. I mean, that's just a regular sphere, right? Um, and the thing you can notice an, uh, immediately about this is that if you have a sphere that's rotating like this, the poles are fixed points. And this is why it makes sense to think about um, the structure of an S1 space as a graph, because it will connect two of the fixed points. So every ZK sphere connects to fixed points, and therefore you can draw it as an edge connecting two vertices of the graph. And I'll label it with, um, with K. So there's one other, I, and, and actually this is all that can happen, I guess. This is, again, it's not obvious, but this is all of the features that can show up that are interesting of the S1 space. Uh, and then you can encode all these things as either fat vertices, vertices, or edges with some labels. Um, but there's one other label that I haven't mentioned, which is that each of these objects, well, I mean, actually each of these vertices, I guess I shouldn't say it. The fat vertex and the regular vertex occur at some value of F1. So you can say, okay, I have a fixed point of the S1 action and it occurs when F1 equals five or whatever. So we also label the vertices with their F1 value. And the way that, that I'm going to draw this, again, it's 90 degrees off of, of what Karshan does in her paper, um, but I'll draw a graph. I'll, I'll think of the F1 axis as being left to right. And then I'll draw all of these, um, uh, all of these features at their corresponding F1 location. So you, you, um, I don't have to write down the labels for F1. I can just I can just draw them like this, and so this is sort of what a, what a um, what a Karshan graph will look like. Um, okay, so I don't know. It takes some time to describe this, but it's it's worthwhile because the idea is that this sort of concept is going to play a key role in the toric lifting in dimension four, which uh, really informs what we're going to be doing in higher dimensions. Okay, so this is all the stuff I already wrote. And here's some examples of uh, 
of Karshan graphs. I mean, this is sort of what I was saying before. So th this is two different Karshan graphs. Um, because there's there's lots of uh, restrictions on what kind of graphs can show up. You can't just draw any graph. And I, and I haven't said exactly what they are, but for instance, the fixed surfaces can only happen at the maximum or minimum values of, uh, um, of the Hamiltonian function of, of F1. Uh, so, okay, so we have some examples of Karshan graphs. And, and I guess I should, I should make a comment that, um, uh, that in this same paper, Karshan also proves that um, all um, Karshan graphs that actually appear as the graph of a, of a Hamiltonian S1 space can be obtained from a certain list of minimal models by a sequence of blow-ups. And she shows what the blow-ups look like on the Karshan graphs and things like this. So she, she tells you which ones are allowed, I guess is what I mean. Um, but I, I should state, I should state her, well, one of her main results from that paper, which is that Hamiltonian S1 spaces are classified by their Karshan graph. So up to isomorphism, which I guess um, I should have written, um, uh, there's a bijection between Hamiltonian S1 spaces and these graphs that I just, just described how to, um, how to construct. So again, we can work entirely with the graphs if we, if we want to. And, and a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about will be really clear to see on the on the graph. Um, okay, so uh, we will continue talking about things from this paper of Karshan from 99. And uh, now I wanna talk about the relationship between the, the two sort of objects I've, I've been mentioning today. So you could start, again, we're in, in dimension M equals four. So you start with a toric integrable system. That means you have two real valued functions who generate um, an effective two torus action. And as we know from the um, Atiyah Goldman Sternberg uh, theorem, the image is going to be a polytope. So I've just given an example of a, of a polytope here. And that polytope has to satisfy the Delzon conditions. And so I've given an example. This is an example of a Delzon, um, a Delzon polytope. It's the second Hirzeberg surface blown up once. Um, okay, so, so that's fine. But what I can do remember is I can just forget one of these functions and that gives me a Hamiltonian S1 space. And so a natural question is uh, what do we know about the Hamiltonian S1 space from just looking at the Delzot polytope, right? Because I, according to Delzot, the Delzot polytope holds all information about the toric system. So in particular, it should tell you what the um, Karshan graph of the underlying Hamiltonian S1 space is. Uh, and in fact, it does. And again, this is this is from the same paper of, of Karshan. Uh, and and once you know the rules, it's it's really easy to read the Karshan graph directly off of the Delzon polytope. So um, here we have uh, a vertical wall in the polytope that actually turns into one of these fat vertices. All of the other vertices of the polytopes, the ones that aren't incident on a vertical wall, these become the regular vertices. And every time you have um, an edge which has non-integer slope, such as this one that I've labeled with slope minus one half, that becomes an edge in the Karshan graph. And you label it with um, the denominator of that, of that fraction of the slope. <clears throat> So, okay, I mean, I did it kind of quickly, but it, it's just, there's some rules and you can read them right off. And it just has to do with understanding um, what the torus action looks like on these different parts of the Delzon polytope and what like the sub torus action looks like, you know, this S1 that's living inside of the T2. So, uh, so you get kind of a picture like, like this, I guess. Corresponding to the S1 space, we have a Karshan graph and you can read the Karshan graph directly off the, um, Polytope. And there's another thing, which I haven't said, um, two things actually. One is that uh, this fat vertex is supposed to be labeled with its area and its area just comes from the length of the, the edge that it corresponds to. Um, but the other thing is that this fat vertex should be um, labeled with a genus as well, right? It's a fixed surface. Uh, but you can think about it for a minute. If you have a surface fixed by one of the S1 actions in a toric system, the other S1 action should act on in a Hamiltonian fashion. So you have a surface with a Hamiltonian S1 action on it. So um, 
automatically any fixed surfaces that show up in a, in a, uh, from a toric system have to have genus zero. And I think this is what I have. Yeah, I've just written again in the next slide. Um, okay, so you can read everything off of the polytope. And actually there's an observation we can make already. Um, so here's the same picture I had from the previous slide. And the observation is that all of the things that, that appear on the, the Karshan graph, the, the vertices or the edges or the, I mean, okay, the fixed surfaces maybe are a little different. Um, well, no, I guess it's all the same. They all come from the boundary of delta. I mean, not even all of the boundary, just parts of the boundary. <clears throat> and so what this means is that if I fix a value of F1, if I look at some level of F1, uh, I can only intersect the boundary of delta twice. Um, so oh, my internet is, oh no, it's fine. Okay, <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, so for any level of F1, I can only intersect the boundary twice, which means you can have at most uh, two features of the F S1 graph in, um, or of the Karshan graph in every level of S1, of F1. So I've said like the, um, I don't know, the contrapositive of this or something. Um, so you can't have more than two features in the same level of F1, right? Because they come from the boundary and a line through a polytope only intersects a boundary twice. So, you know, it either comes from the top or it comes from the bottom. So I'm kind of belaboring this point, but it's, it's a key idea, especially in higher dimensions. Oh, I have something in the chat, maybe I should. Uh, uh, oh, <laughs> um, anyway, sorry. Um, so, uh, Okay, so it turns out that this, this observation um, is not only an observation, it's an if and only if statement. So that, that's, I mean, I haven't argued that at all. That's, that's not clear at this point, but it's true. And this is one of the results also from, from Karshan's paper in 99. Um, so if you have a Hamiltonian F1 space, then there exists a, a toric lift, if and only if there's in most two features in the graph at each level of F1 and the genus of any fixed surface equals zero, right? I mean, I said that the genus is, is automatically zero. Um, and there's equivalent ways to write this. Let me check the time before I know how much I should chat. Um, equivalently, the genus of any fixed surface equals zero and at each non-extremal level set of F1, it contains at most not two non-free orbits. So this is just exactly the same as this statement, except written in terms of um, uh, in terms of the S1 action instead of in terms of the graph. Okay, so this is kind of the prototypical result for, for the stuff I'm going to be talking about today. We have conditions on the S1 space um, that tell us exactly when it lifts to a toric integrable system. Um, right, so here's a very quick example. So it turns out that you can, you can obtain an S1 space like this. This is a totally valid graph of an S1 space. But in a single level of, of F1, I have three different fixed points. And so this can never come from a toric integrable system because uh, there's too many things happening all at once. One of them happens on the top, the other one happens on the bottom, there's nowhere else for the third one. Uh, and so sort of a corollary of this, of this example is that not all S1 spaces come from a toric system. Which, which was, I mean, is, is quite clear. Uh, but the S1 spaces or the complexity one spaces in general are much more rich uh, group. Okay, so I will briefly uh, give a sort of one slide overview of some lifting results in dimension four. Uh, and then I'll, I'll get to sort of the meat of the talk, which is let's go to higher dimensions. So I just talked about how in 99, on has if and only if conditions for when a toric lift of an S1 space exists. Um, so some years after that, um, Pollock, Sabatini, Seppi, and, and Symington um, came up with conditions for, uh, for when you can lift to what's called a semi-toric system. So I'm not sure how familiar everyone is, but I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on it. But, um, uh, but yeah, some, some results they have that were announced in 2014 tell you, given an S1 space, when can you find a second function that, that lifts it to a semi-toric system, which is nice, but not quite as nice as toric, maybe as a way to think about it. And a key step in this is a previous paper that they had that came out in 2013, um, 
which is how to obtain the Karshan graph from the semi-toric polygon. Remember, something that was important when we were talking about toric lifting is how you can take the Delzon polytope and obtain the, um, the Karshan graph. Because then you want to say, well, which graphs can lift? And um, so they, they showed how you can use what's called a semi-toric polygon, which is kind of a decorated polygon, to read the Karshan graph of the underlying S1 space off of that. Um, and then more recently with, uh, with Sonia Holock, uh, I proved the following, which is if you're given any Hamiltonian S1 space, again, remember M is compact for this whole talk, um, given any Hamiltonian S1 space, you can always find a second function F2 such that M omega F1 F2 uh, is an integrable system and all singular points are non-degenerate or um, of a certain type of degenerate point called uh, parabolic. So, um, so there's no conditions in, in this case for lifting for this type of system. And so this type of system um, here is called hypersemitoric. So maybe you've heard this word. I mean, in fact, Sonia talked about this um, in this seminar, I don't know, six months ago or something. Um, so, um, right, and, and another comment about this. So the nicest kind of lift you might hope for is a, a lift in which every singular point of the integrable system is non-degenerate. Um, but we also, we proved that that's not possible. There's, there's examples of S1 spaces that have to have some degeneracy in their lift. And these parabolic points, um, are sort of the most mild or more most well-behaved of degenerate points. So essentially what we said is, okay, you can't lift every S1 space to uh, a non-degenerate integrable system, but by allowing the, the nicest kind of degenerate points, you are able to lift it. This is sort of the, this result. I'm not spending too much time on this because, um, uh, well, because I want to get to higher dimensions, right? But I should mention Joey, we can't hear you anymore. Anymore. How long? Yeah, have now you we can. Any... Oh, you can. Just okay. a few seconds, ah, like okay. two or three seconds. Ah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> so um, just just rewind, like. Five, five seconds Yeah, ago. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, right, so, so that I'll, I'll just mention a few ingredients of the proof, I guess. And one of the first key ingredients is, um, uh, is, is this paper from 2013, which is that you know how to get the Karshan graph from uh, the semi toric polygon uh, of a system. Uh, and, and another key uh, ingredient for us is the, um, the Plyo and Vunigat classification of, of semi toric systems from 2009 and 2011. And so we sort of use those two things to uh, build a semi toric integrable system, which doesn't quite lift our S1 space, but, but does some approximation of it. Um, and then we use this paper of Holger Doolin and, and Alvaro Plyo from 2016 uh, to introduce what are called flaps in the system. And, and again, I'm, I'm I'm skipping through this extremely quickly, but I want to mention one thing about the, the flaps that we use, which is that essentially the idea is to use disconnected fibers of the integrable system. So in the examples I've already given about um, you know, the torque systems, we understand how ZK spheres can, can appear on either the top or the bottom of the Delzon polytope. Um, but if you have lots of ZK spheres that you want to show up uh, you know, more than two, sort of you need more than one top of your polygon. So uh, what we do is we use disconnected, we purposely disconnect the fibers of our integrable system, kind of so that our, poly, our polygon has, has many upper boundaries. And then you can put all the different ZK spheres on those. So uh, again, I'm explaining this probably way too quickly. Um, but, but a, a similar technique will show up in higher dimensions. And I'll explain it a little bit more slowly. But I, I just wanted to see, give a little bit of foreshadowing, I guess. Um, OK, so, so the situation in dimension four is, is, is pretty well, I mean, very well understood. Um, so let's go to higher dimensions. That is, I'm a little bit half, past half my talk. So the, the last bit of my talk will all be in um, 
in higher dimensions. So let's start with a two n dimensional symplectic manifold. And let's assume we have a complexity one space on it, which is n minus one real valued functions. Um, so the first question is given this complexity one space, when can we find one more function to make it so that it's a toric integrable system? So this is, this is the first question I'll talk about. I'll probably talk about it for 20 minutes. Um, and remember when dimension of M is equal to four, everything that had to do with dimension of M equals four relied heavily on Karshan's result that the S1 spaces are classified by these graphs. I mean, we go through as much effort as possible so that I can just look at graphs and, and, and read information directly off the graph. Um, so, uh, so if we want to have any hope of understanding the answer to this question, lifting a complexity in one space to a toric system in higher dimensions, we need to understand the, the, the classifications of both of those objects. So the classifications of toric systems is already known. This is the, the Delzon classification works in all dimensions. Um, and so what I'll talk about now is the classification of complexity one spaces. So, um, oh, sorry, my Apple software is trying to update. Okay, sorry, there. Um, so, uh, so the classification of tall complexity one spaces is due to um, Karshan and Tolman in uh, a series of papers, but culminating in a paper in 2014. And in two slides, I'll tell you what the word tall means. So uh, again, we have a complexity one space, M omega phi. I'll let T be my complexity one torus, the, the torus of dimension N minus one. And I'll let phi be the Hamiltonian function for this action, which in principle should be a map into the dually algebra of the torus. But again, I'm thinking about this as R N minus one. Um, so let's think about symplectic reduction. So if you pick some point in the, um, uh, in the image of the moment map, and you take its pre-image, phi inverse of C generically should have dimension N plus one, right? Because because we've uh, we have something of dimension two N and we have a map into something of dimension N minus one. So the pre-image should have dimension N plus one. And then we quotient by an N minus one dimensional torus. So typically, this should be dimension two. Um, and so a uh, complexity in one space is called tall if it's always dimension two. I mean, either dimension two or empty. Um, so uh, it might be that, that you know, in some sort of singular situations, you have a, um, a single point in that reduced space. So, so here's an example of a not tall system. Say I take CP2 with the underlying, uh, S1 action, that I mean like I've been doing, the, the first component S1 action, so the Karshan graph looks like this. Um, if you take symplectic reduction at this last level, you just get one point, right? You take the pre-image of this level, you get um, a single point, you quotient by the torus action, you still get a single point. So CP2, this is not tall. Um, and, and, and that's sort of the idea in higher dimensions as well, that around the boundary, you might have points that are not tall, but I, I require them all to be tall. And, and this is where their, um, their classification applies. Uh, okay, so, um, so what's known? Again, the Atiyah gilman sternberg theorem tells us that the image of phi should be a convex polytope, but unlike the Delzon situation, this does not classify the system. And sort of the natural thing to do is to start with the, the polytope, start with the, um, the image of phi of M, I'm gonna call it delta, and, um, and just decorate it with some extra information that tells you about that information that, um, that's kind of lost, the information that, that isn't included just in the image. Uh, and that information is essentially gonna be about what are called exceptional orbits. So th this is kind of like in the, I mean, it's extremely similar to the case of a dimension of m equals four, in which we wanted this graph to hold the data of all of the orbits that have something significant, something different going on in them. Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, sort of the, the the special orbits need to need to have um, need to be encoded somehow. And so, for a complexity one space, an orbit is called exceptional if its stabilizer. Uh, is strictly larger than the stabilizer of nearby orbits in the same fiber. 
So, uh, okay, maybe it, it takes a second to exactly parse why these are the important orbits. Um, but it, you can just think about them as the generalization of ZK spheres, right? ZK spheres are the ones where they have they have a non-trivial stabilizer. They have a ZK stabilizer, but the points nearby don't. So, uh, so we can sort of pick out the points whose stabilizer is, is special. And these are going to be the ones that sort of hold all of the information. Um, so an example of exceptional orbits are the, the ZK spheres and S1 spaces. And, um, and let me note something. So remember, I'm talking about orbits that are special. Uh, so let me make a comment about the orbit space, which is that the, um, uh, the moment map, that which is a map from M to delta, actually descends to, um, to a map on orbits, right? Because it, it's constant on each orbit. So you have a map on the orbits. And so, uh, so this is, I don't know, something that will be useful in this very next definition, which is that the skeleton of a complexity one space M omega phi is the set of exceptional orbits. So the, the orbits who have these sort of um, larger than usual uh, stabilizers. Um, and they're labeled with their, their isotopy info uh, with their um, stabilizer. And, um, and they also come equipped with a map onto delta, which is, which is the way I want to think about it, right? Because the momentum map, its image is delta. Okay, great. The momentum map uh, descends to the orbit space. And now I can say, what is the image of all the special orbits? That, that, that's, what I, that's what I want to say. So, so this um, object I'm going to be kind of interested in looking at is the image of all of the special orbits. And it's a subset of this um, polytope. So, uh, right. So let me draw some examples. Um, so let's say the polytope is a rectangle. So for this example, I'm going to imagine the dimension of M is six. And so the moment image is, is two dimensional. So it's some, some shape. And then the image of the exceptional points generally looks like a graph inside of this shape. So it might be something simple. It might be just a line. Uh, I'm going to write a couple of different examples. Um, it can also cross over itself. So it might be like a line and another line. So I haven't really indicated it here, but these two lines, um, well, I guess what I want to say is that you might have exceptional orbits that don't actually intersect each other in the graph. They just pass over each other. Sorry, sorry, in the, in the symplectic manifold. But when you project down to the moment image, they cross each other like this. So, so this is an example also. Um, but, but actually, you could have sort of an interesting uh, configuration. I mean, it's, it's, it's really a graph, what the, what the exceptional orbits look like. They might split, or they might interact, or intersect, or whatever. Um, so you might have something more like this. And I was going to draw one more picture, which will be a relevant one later. So here's an example of, uh, of a graph. Um, so, so right, the point is that if I'm thinking about six manifolds, then the exceptional orbits are going to give me some kind of um, stack of graphs. The graphs, you know, they, they could intersect with each other. You might have um, lines that pass over each other or actually connect in a vertex. Um, various sorts of things can happen. And the graph can have a cycle in it, which is the reason I put that last example up. Um, so let's see if I remembered the right pictures. I did. Um, and uh, so those, those are some examples of, of skeletons in dimension six. And there's three other invariants. One of them is the genus. Remember, if you take the symplectic reduction at some level, since we're in a tall space, you always get a surface. And it turns out that all of those surfaces all have the same uh, genus. It might be some kind of singular surface or something, but up to, um, up to homeomorphism, it's, it's just a surface of some genus. And so that genus is one of the invariants of the complexity one space. Um, there's also something called the doisman heckman measure, which, which um, probably people know about. It's, um, it's a measure on the moment image, which is essentially the push forward of the uh, symplectic volume on the manifold. And it actually turns out it has to be compatible with the, um, with the skeleton in a certain way. The skeleton tells you how its derivative will change, things like this. 
And there's another invariant called the painting invariant, which is more complicated. And I'm going to, um, sorry, I'm going to talk about it on the next slide. Um, so the painting invariant roughly encodes how the exceptional orbits move around the reduced space while you traverse the skeleton. There, there's, there's various ways you can interpret it. I think to me, maybe this is the easiest way to, uh, to think about it, but it, it is a little bit more than what I'm about to say, but this is kind of the idea. So the idea is, let me take, so, so first of all, let me take some random point um, in the moment image. If I take the symplectic reduction at that random point, I'll get a nice smooth surface. So let's, let's assume that, um, uh, that the genus of this example is one, in which case, if I take a random point, I'll just get a nice smooth torus, and that's fine. If I take some point that's on the skeleton, though, then I will still get something that's homeomorphic to the torus. But the fact that I have an exceptional orbit means when I do the symplectic reduction, um, something, something singular shows up. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm reducing by a group action that's not free. And so I'll end up with a picture roughly that looks like this. It's still a torus, but it has like a singular point, some sort of, uh, I don't know, some sort of, of, of singularity in the smooth structure. And the reason that I chose this example in particular is that this is one where the painting has a cycle. So if I want, I can just travel along, sorry, not the painting, the, the skeleton. I can travel along the skeleton in a loop. And while I'd make that, that journey, this singular point is going to move around the torus, right? You know, maybe at, at some other point, uh, the singular point is like, you know, now it's over here or whatever. And so you just let that, that singular point sort of draw the path. It starts here and it goes like this, and then it goes like this, and it does whatever. And, um, and eventually that it ends up back where it started because I ended up back at the same um, at the same point here. So the, the, what I'm trying to say is that there's a, a distinguished point on the torus. And as I go around this cycle on the skeleton, that point will, will draw a path. You imagine it like, like painting a path as it goes, it goes along. And that path could be trivial or it could be non-trivial or it could be whatever. And the painting invariant sort of encodes that information. How the singular points move around um, uh, so it's sort of how the skeleton sits inside of the orbit space, because it might be twisting around things in a really complicated way, or maybe not. Um, so I, I don't know. I hope that made some sense. It's not exactly the formal definition, but it is sort of the idea that it has to do with sort of a twisting of the, the singular points. Uh, the formal definition is, uh, is that it's a map from the skeleton to this surface um, so that this pairing... Oops, um, of this map and the moment map is an injective map uh, onto here. So I, I don't know. I, I, I would not be able to understand that definition by just seeing it in a talk for 30 seconds. So, uh, but it, it encodes a little bit more than, than, what I, than what I said. I mean, for instance, the genus doesn't have to actually be non-trivial for the painting to be non-trivial. You could have two singular points that are like, orbiting around each other or something like this. I mean, their paths can still be uh, twisted up in kind of an interesting way. So it's a very subtle invariant. And, um, and, and what I should say, I mean, actually, I didn't write this in a, in a slide, but this result of the 2014 paper of, of um, Karshan and Tolman is that the painting or the, the invariants I've just described, the skeleton, dorsman heckman measure, genus, uh, moment image, and um, painting classify complexity, tall complexity one spaces. And so we can really just work in terms of these invariants if we wanna understand questions about the complexity one spaces. Uh, and that's what I wanna do. So uh, I have 10 minutes. Let's do the same picture we did before, but now in higher dimensions. So I can start with a toric integrable system. This is three. So, so let's say I'm in dimension M equals six. I start with a toric integrable system. This is three real valued functions. 
since it's a toric integrable system, its image is going to be a polytopen R3. And then what I can do if I want to is just forget one of the functions. So if I forget one of the functions, then um, I'm left with a complexity one space, m omega f1, f2. And you might ask, what are the invariants of this complexity one space? You know, how can you get the invariance of the complexity, the underlying complexity one space from the toric system? And uh, I mean, and, and it isn't so hard to read off actually. So first of all, the image of your moment map is just gonna be the projection of this down. So this is, uh, it isn't right under it. Let me do it better. Um, I don't know if that's better or worse. Um, this is supposed to be the, the sort of shadow of this box. Um, so the moment image is, is clearly the, the, the projection of, this, this, uh, of the moment image upstairs. But then we also need to understand the decorations, which is, is to say the skeleton. So um, the skeleton is actually just the image of the, uh, the edges and vertices from upstairs. So for instance, this line, right? The, this picture I'm trying to draw here is like a cube with, with one edge chopped off. So this line descends to uh, this line. And so then uh, if I drew it you know, upright instead of sitting on its side, this is the, the skeleton that we ended up with. So you can read the skeleton, at least the image of the skeleton, directly off the um, Delzon polytope. And um, the genus is gonna be zero for sort of the same reason the genus was zero in the other case. Um, the Deutschmann Heckman measure is just given by uh, the height at each point. And the painting is always trivial. This is another important thing. The painting is always trivial because roughly, uh, if I choose some level, you can see the singular point of the reduced space is gonna correspond to this edge in the polytope. And um, if the edge of the polytope is always on the, the ceiling of the polytope, it doesn't have any chance to like twist around. So that, that's the main idea, it's, it's non-trivial to see and, and actually non-trivial to prove also. But the idea is that um, you take the projection of the polytope and the projection of all of its edges and things in the interior, um, G equals zero and painting is trivial. And this gives you the invariance of the underlying complexity of one space. And th this is joined again with, um, with Sue and Jason. Um, okay, and so, for instance, here's another example of a toric integrable system on a six manifold. Um, and if I take the projection of this downwards, again, I'm gonna get a rectangle. One of these edges will give me a line and the other interior edge will give me a line, right? You can see that, um, uh, I mean, you can just see that, that this edge and this edge are the only things going on in the interior of the projection. And that gives you the skeleton. So, uh, so that's an example of how you can get one of the other pictures I drew earlier. So let me see. Okay, I have six minutes. Um, let's consider another skeleton. So it turns out this is also a valid skeleton. I, it's right, you can't just draw any graph you possibly want to, but, but, um, but this one is also valid. And if you look at this picture, and if you think about something you learned 30 minutes ago, you will hopefully see what, uh, well, what I want you to see here, which is that let's try to figure out how to lift this skeleton to a toric system. If you lift it, then for instance, this edge has to come from some edge that's on say the top of the polytope. Since this other one crosses along it, but they don't actually, and it's not really a vertex there, they don't actually intersect. It has to come from the bottom of the polytope because these things need to go, um, you know, you can't like run them into each other, I guess. Uh, but now I have another edge and this other edge, there's no room for it on the top and there's no room for it on the bottom. And so it's not gonna work. Um, so, I mean, this is the reason I spent so much time on, um, the arguments about the four-dimensional case, because it's really the same concept. In the four-dimensional case, if you try to lift to a toric system, you need room on the top and you need room on the bottom. 
to put the different features of the graph. And so if you have three features of the graph all on top of each other, you're never gonna be able to get it to work. Uh, in the higher dimensional case, it's the same. Each component of the skeleton either needs to go on the top or on the bottom. Um, but a, a situation like this one, where you just can't split it into two groups that um, uh, where the moment map is injective, essentially, then, um, then you can never lift it to something to work. And so the results that I have with, um, uh, with, with Leo and, and, and Tolman is that, uh, well, and I've put the year as 2024 question mark. I, I'm confident we'll get it out by 2020, before the end of 2024. Maybe a miracle would occur and it'll come out in 2023, but I don't think so, but it'll be soon. I should say it like that. Anyway, um, so the, the theorem we have is that uh, just like in the dimension four case, this observation that you can't have three different things all collapsing onto something um, that tells you if you can lift, the graph should be too colorable is actually if and only if. So that means if you start with a tall complexity one space, then you can lift it to a toric system if and only if the genus is zero, the painting is trivial, and I'll say the skeleton is too colorable. And so what that means is, is more or less exactly what I've been kind of dancing around. The connected components of the skeleton can be separated into two sets, um, one of which is going to correspond to the top of the polytope, and the other one's going to correspond to the bottom of the polytope. And so uh, when you project it down, it should be injective on each of those sets separately. So those two sets can intersect each other, but they can't intersect them themselves, sort of. Um, I can talk quickly, and I can finish a few more things. Um, so half of the proof I essentially already described, which is that if it lifts, the skeleton should be too colorable. Um, so the other half of the proof is the construction direction. That's this direction. And the idea of the construction direction, I can, I can explain it with some, some pictures. Uh, the idea is you just choose one of the vertices. I mean, we'd actually start at a corner, but for this picture, let me start here. Um, and we just need to prove that the types of, of intersections of the graph that can show up in a complexity one space can always be lifted into a Delzant corner um, of the, uh, um, the three-dimensional space. So you have like the, the 2D, I mean, I'm saying two to three, but it's actually arbitrary dimension, but you have something that's in the graph, you wanna lift it to a three-dimensional thing that projects down to it. So it isn't so hard to show that for a single vertex. Um, and then actually what you can do is if you take some vertex that's connected by an edge, you can prove that that one can lift in a compatible way, right? You need to make sure that they're compatible with each other. When the next edge lifts, it needs to, right? This picture is supposed to be 3D. I'm not sure if it's clear. Um, when the next edge lifts, the, the, the polytope needs to like connect with it. The difficulty occurs um, when you keep saying, okay, if I lifted this vertex, I know how to lift at the vertex next door. Uh, and you say, okay, from this vertex, now I know how to lift at this vertex. And from that vertex, now I know how to lift at this vertex. And now suddenly we're back at the vertex we started with. And you better hope that the, the, the vertex you started with is still compatible with this thing on the, on the cycle. So the existence of the cycles in the graphs is, is one of the main sources of the, um, um, of the difficulty here, because what you want to do is lift all vertices in a compatible way to get the whole top of the polytope. And then for the other color, you do the whole bottom of the polytope. Um, and that's sort of very vaguely the idea, um, the idea of the proof. So making sure that things are compatible along cycles, um, it, uh, I, I don't know, it takes quite a lot of effort actually, but it turns out to work out. So let me spend, I, mean, I know it's exactly 11 o'clock, but let me spend one minute saying, um, saying that, that we can go even further than this. That, um, so this is this, I mean, this is, this is the, the big theorem in the um, in toric lifting for arbitrary dimension. Um, but maybe instead of asking if we can lift to a toric integrable system, let's ask for something a little bit, um, a little bit more general. And so the question would be, Given a complexity one space, when can we lift it to an integrable system for which all um, singular points are non-degenerate? So I don't have time to explain this in detail, obviously, but um, 
non-degenerate singular points exist in, in uh, integrable systems in a totally analogous way to non-degenerate singularities in, um, in Morse theory. And if you have a system where all the points are non-degenerate, then you have sort of a local form for what the system should look like at those points. So I'm, I'm compressing what could easily be an hour talk into two sentences. Um, but th this is a very natural question. And the conjecture that, that Sue Tolman and I have is that um, uh, if you start with a tall complexity one space, then you can lift it to a completely non-degenerate system if and only if the painting is non-trivial. And so I wanted to bring up this, this um, conjecture because I think it's a nice interaction between something that to me, I can really get my hands on, a non-degenerate integrable system, and this, this other sort of mysterious invariant, which is the, um, um, the painting invariant. And, and, and joining with Sue Tolman, I've been working on the, the construction direction, um, which is the, the starting with a complexity one space with non-trivial painting, and trying to um, construct an integrable system, which is completely non-degenerate, that has that, you know, try and construct the FN. Um, and and we, we've had a decent amount of progress on that. I mean, maybe I could write 2024 for this result as well, for just this direction, just the construction direction. But, um, but maybe that's too, maybe that's too ambitious. I don't know. Um, so I, I, now I can just say, in terms of open questions, things that would still be interesting to work on, um, the other direction of this conjecture would certainly be interesting. Starting with a, an integrable system that's completely non-degenerate and trying to prove the underlying painting is trivial. Uh, and I can make a comment, which is that um, the word tall has shown up in all my, my results today. And so it would certainly be nice to try and do a similar thing without this tall condition. And, and this is what, um, what Sue's grad student, um, uh, Jason Liu is, is, is working on. He's, he's working on the removing this, this condition, I guess. Um, okay, so, so uh, I guess that's all I have to say uh, for today. So yeah, thanks again. Any questions for Joey? Yeah, I actually do have a question. Oh, hi. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Go ahead, please. Um, so can you go back to the slide where you prove the extendability to the toric system for a complexity one? You now you give the condition. So genus zero painting is trivial. Yeah. Right. So um so somehow the Doisterman Heckman function should play a role because if you put a Doisterman Heckman function that is so I mean somehow you know as mm -hmm. you described right the Doisterman Heckman function in the tall case you are just taking the length of the segments that you get by intersecting mm -hmm. the polytope right so um somehow the way you get the Delzan polytope which is what we did um in another project in the monotone case is mm -hmm. by so right so somehow if you are given the image of the moment map and you are given a um and you are given a dorsum heckman function what you can do is try to slide these these segments vertically to try mm -hmm. to get a delzant thing and yeah. here there is no mention of this dorsum heckman function so it's it sounds a little so where where is it hidden well i, I guess the yeah this is a great question um and I guess it's kind of just hidden in the fact that since the Dorsman Heckman function is, um, uh, I mean, it's compatible with the skeleton that you have. So you have, I mean, so say I have some, uh, so here's my moment image and my skeleton is, you know, say it's too colorable. So here's one of these and here's one of, one of those. Um, and yeah, I guess the point is that since the, derivative of the Deutschmann Heckman function changes the way it's supposed to at these um uh along these edges right I mean there's there's I didn't talk about it at all but 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 you know there's conditions on the compatibility between the the Deutschmann Heckman function uh and the skeleton so and... what you're saying sorry what you're saying is that the skeleton so the skeleton should determine I mean I know that there is a relation right yeah. 
um, but uh, this relation is really given by the weights of the action at the fixed points. So you're saying that in your case, the skeleton determines the weights? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the skeleton is, you know, it's the, um, I mean, I'm drawing it like it's just a graph, but um, but technically the skeleton is the set of all exceptional orbits labeled with their isotropy. Ah, yes. okay. so, ah so I, I'm see, being, I see, I'm being, I see, I see, I um, see, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Now it makes sense. Okay, because mm -hmm, otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, you may have weights that are not primitive and so you don't know actually what exactly. the weights are. Yes, yes, yes I yeah, yeah. you're saying. Okay, okay. So yeah, so it, it's, it's, I mean, uh, uh, I don't know, in the, I don't know, giving a talk and talking fast. I said this, but I said it very quickly. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I, I was no, 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 okay. to, to, to catch it. Yes, it makes sense. It makes sense. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So the, the data yeah. is there. I mean, I mean, you can, you can almost recover the deutschmann ekman measure from, from the labeled skeleton. I think there's like a, uh, yes. yeah. action of SL2 or SLNZ and, uh, and a scaling. So something like this. So there's a little bit that's not exactly determined. Um, uh, right. I mean, if you have a tall, especially if you have a tall space, right? Because well, as long as you have a, a tall, you can. If you have a tall space, I think once you give the symplectic volume of a reduction, it should be, it yes. should be determined, right? Exactly. If, if you determine it at. At, at one vertex, uh, maybe. Yeah. Well, yeah, like a neighborhood of one vertex, maybe or something. Because I think there's like a, you, I mean, you know, you could imagine like a box or you could imagine a box with slope one on the top. And these both have. Um, but that should be that should be encoded then in the in the in the skeleton the fact that you have a slope right. or not, right? Because it, it it's it's saying it's saying that one of the derivatives is not zero, which should be encoded in in the weights. Yes. Yeah. 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 You're right. It's um. Well, but the 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 weight that has that in it is the weight that you forget when you project down to the that's true one that's true that's true yeah. i see i see i see yes 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 so yes. there's a little bit of freedom but not a whole lot okay okay mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah yeah um, it, would, it would be interesting maybe to to kind of understand right how explicitly this can be uh, retrieved from the one skeleton it seems to be a natural question somehow Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause I mean, you know, I like, uh, I don't know, I like drawing pictures and I like drawing graphs and things like this. So, uh, you can get quite far with just a skeleton. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's like a little bit, I mean, you have to make it a little bit precise, I guess. Um, um, okay. I, I think, I think I understand. Right. So, I mean, your toric extension is of course not unique. Right. Yeah. And okay, so I think the question, the right question to ask is whether there is a minimal set of conditions of decorations that you can, you know, that you can give on the toric one skeleton that determine toric extension uniquely somehow. Sure. Yeah, yeah. That would be, I mean, I think the weights at one point would be enough. Mm, mm, mm. Um, because once you, um, well, I mean, it's, it's like I was saying when I drew a picture that has gone now, like at, at each of these vertices, I want to lift the weights. Mm -hmm. And once you lift the weights, um, the weight and the volume at one point, I mean, you need like the Deutschmann Hackman at, at one point and you need the lifted weights at one point and then everything else is, is determined sort of. Um, uh, well, there is, there is something to prove, I think. Yeah, I, I don't, yeah, yeah. yeah. I there's, some, there's something. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I don't see clearly how everything is, um, is given, right? I mean, it's. Yeah. Uh, I guess, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm. I'm speaking freely, I guess, but but also I'm I'm thinking about the one colorable case, which is so maybe on the two colorable case you need a little bit more because one colorable is like you imagine the bottom is flat and you just lift the top, and that, that's not going to be then you not, then you need to prove that it is the zamp what you're doing. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, but yeah, maybe you need like the weights at. Uh, vertex of each color, you know, one vertex of red color and one vertex of blue color, and you need the deutschmann heckman measure at one point or something like probably, that. Probably, probably, yeah. yes. Um, oh. So, yeah, so it's like uniqueness kind of questions. We, I mean, we, we haven't, you know, they come up a little bit, but it's not really been our focus. Our focus is like, does there exist a lift? Yes, um, yes. And then the number of lifts is already, a, I mean, was, is already a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, Charlotte, you've got your hand raised. 
Uh, yeah, so my question was actually sort of half answered. I okay. I wanted to ask, um, I wanted to ask how non-unique the lift is, or sort of what yeah, what you what you know about how how different the uh, the resulting lifts can actually end up being. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it's essentially what we were just. May I need a uh, uh, maybe I need a blank page, but um, I mean yeah, the idea is. Uh, I'm trying to think if you can see it. You can already almost see it in um, in dimension four, but let me let me try and draw a picture. See my artistic ability here. Um, so here's kind of a simple example. Um, so the the skeleton at this point is just going to be one edge. So the if I project this down, I have a line like this, which is the image of this, this edge here. Um, and yeah, the idea, I guess, is that if I didn't, if I forgot to give you the dorsum and Ackman measure, right, if you didn't have that information, um, then there is an extra thing you can do, which is you can just imagine stretching it out a lot. And this will still give the same skeleton. And, and this is totally due to the fact that we're looking at the tall case, because the tall case is exactly the one where the top boundary and the bottom boundary never meet, which is why our, our techniques are, are working pretty well in the tall case, because um, you can sort of turn it into two separate problems. Um, but another thing you can do, which is not special about being tall, is you can act with, um, you know, you can you can sort of skew the whole thing upwards, which is going to be impossible for me to draw, I guess, but I can try. Um, so uh, maybe the front of the polytope looks the same, but instead of going straight back, I like have have acted with SL two Z. So that's supposed to be um, this polytope, but like skewed. And now its projection downwards is uh, oops, is still going to be that same picture. Um, and roughly speaking, if you just have a um, one colorable skeleton, so if you just have a skeleton where all of the interesting stuff is happening on just one side of the polytope, then these are sort of the only things that can happen. So you either... Um, have like scaled the dorsum and Hagman measure, or uh, I mean, actually, there's there's I should draw a better picture, um, because you can still imagine that the bottom is flat. Um, you know, if you skew the top of it and the bottom is still flat, that's also fun. This will still project to the same to the same thing. Um, so there's definitely some some unknown in terms of the dorsum and Hagman function if I don't give it to you, but it's it's only I mean this is what I was saying to, to Sylvia it's it's essentially you can scale it or you can you can shift it, but actually in this case, if you sort of skew the whole thing in a way that preserves a projection, that also doesn't change the dorsum and Hagman function. It doesn't change anything. So so um, this first one and this third one are going to have exactly the same underlying complexity one space. And so this is an example of two different lifts from the same underlying space. And, and that's, it's like SL n minus one. It's, it's like, uh, maybe this is acting something like this. Um, uh, yeah, because because it, it's, uh, yeah, that's all this going. On. So, so th this this is like the the. Sorry, I'm getting confused if I am saying this right. Um, yeah, but it, it's it's like a normal it's like a normal torus action, right? I I have all of the torus determined except for one thing. I can uh, act with um, isomorphisms of the torus to add integer multiples of the other components into this one. Kind of that, that's kind of what's going on. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you, thank you, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, vague, I understood. Uh... I think I understand this a lot better now. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. And yeah, it's definitely an interesting question. I mean, I mean, to me, with the the complexity one, um, 
integrable systems, these integrable systems with underlying complexity one spaces, there's sort of like two opposite questions. So the whole talk today was about lifting. So given the complexity of one space, when can I even find a function that's up there? Um, but another kind of question is, suppose I have lifted a complexity one space. Now, what, like, what can I do upstairs? So, so this is something I worked on with, with Johan Leflock in dimension four, um, which is like fixing an S1 action and then uh, looking at the space of integrable systems that lift that S1 action. And if you change things about the integrable systems, you can undergo bifurcations and you can do all, I mean, you can do many things. And, and I think this is, to me, this is kind of the next step for, um, uh, for the complexity one systems. So I, I guess things like non-uniqueness are, are, are a, sort of a first thing in this direction of, now we're upstairs, what can we do up here? Uh, yeah, thanks. All right. Uh, are there any other questions for Joey? If there are no more questions, then uh, let's thank Joey one more time. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. See you in a couple of weeks again. Yeah. Thanks, <laughs> thanks Joey. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the invitation. It's, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> Nice. Okay. Bye, everyone.